There's a saying in traditional Chinese medicine that sick people make the best doctors. Our next speaker faced a life-threatening illness in 1987. Having regained his health from regular Qigong practice, he was inspired to learn medical Qigong from Tom Tam and eventually found his way to China and Taiwan looking for the root of these arts. Eventually encountering Qigong master Wu Wenwei, Paul dove headfirst into training, Tanggu Shangong, a form of Qigong which he now teaches. Also a licensed acupuncturist, he has taught medical Qigong at Five Element Acupuncture in Florida. Please welcome Paul Fraser as he gives us the theory behind using Qigong to treat serious illness. All right, welcome everybody, and uh, thank you uh, for having me. I really uh, uh, am. We're about to talk about something that is um, actually I'm really quite passionate about, which is um, using these Taoist arts to um, overcome the condition of cancer. Um, and just to say that this is a little bit more than theoretical for me. Um, uh, I've had three months to live for the first uh, for the last 36 years. Uh, I had uh, bone cancer uh, twice, first when I was 13 and again when I was 19. And um, came to all of these arts because um, someone used Chinese medicine to save my life. Um, mo most specifically, the practice of Qigong. Um, and as uh, as my health restored in uh, I think it was about six weeks uh, I, they'd given me three months I'd gone to see uh, this guy who as it turns out it was his specialty uh, to treat cancer through Chinese medicine he was new to the United States his name is Tom Tam he's in Boston and um, I went to see him and uh, through the use of both acupuncture and a, an applied Qigong um, I be I had a clear a clean bill of health in about six weeks. Um, now, granted, I was 19 years old, so I had a lot in my favor at that time. I had still had plenty of of uh, strength and vitality and youth behind me. Uh, I'm uh, soon to be 56, so uh, it would probably you know if this were to happen again, it would probably be a little bit more of a struggle today than it was then. But even having said that, um, I was given no hope, and uh, I'm still here. Um, maybe even to some people's disappointment, but here we are. Um, and so this is so when I when I um, talk about this sort of thing, it it is very much from personal experience. Since then, I um, do the normal route of of studying Chinese medicine, acupuncture. Um, I've taught at a bunch of acupuncture schools, but always it's come back to this concept for me of energy cultivation, because as I'm sure most of you know, with, without the disciplines of Qigong and energy cultivation, the rest of Chinese medicine wouldn't exist. Um, one, of the, one of the funniest um, classes that I ever took when I was in acupuncture school was um, the history of Chinese medicine, because it was clearly made up. Um, you know, one of the things that people would would I remember somebody saying, well, we think that perhaps acupuncture came about through battle wounds. And I'm trying to imagine somebody with a with an arrow going through his chest saying, you know, on the plus side, my asthma is really feeling pretty good right now. It doesn't make sense. And the reason that it doesn't make sense is that she and blood, of course, uh, behave similarly to injury, right? If we tra traumatize a part of the body, the chi first and the blood also will retreat so that we don't lose them. Um, more specifically, I think Chinese medicine came about through the concept of people cultivating qi, the earliest writings. Some of the earliest writings in China actually deal with this subject on how to cultivate this life force and, and promote longevity. And so as those, as those energies grow and strengthen, they begin to amplify the five senses. As the five senses begin to amplify, we begin to see in other realms or other spectrums. And in this way, we can see energy entering and leaving the body and how it's how we're affected by that. And I believe that, the, that these disciplines came about through people writing them down for the benefit of those people who aren't able to see. And so when we think about this in terms of cancer, if we look at some of the, the more ancient writings, the ancient writings actually talk a lot about... Um, cancer is being more like a chronic condition, which is kind of interesting. Like we, we see it in our culture or today as something that's very acute, right? We were threatened by this disease and, and it often takes people very quickly. 
But in reading the writings that go back at least 3,000 years, they say, oh, well, you know, when one develops a condition of cancer, if it isn't dealt with, it could take your life in 10 to 20 years. Um, and so I, I became sort of fascinated with, well, what's the difference? What, what was happening then versus what's happening now? I think a big part of it, of course, are the arts that we all study. Um, that, you know, in those times, I think people were living a little bit more in harmony with a whole lot less stress. So when we think about that in terms of, of cancer, for example, it was also viewed as a condition of what they called suppression. Um, and, and the idea was, even back then, the writings were about sort of suppressing feelings, not being able to move them all the way through. And that those feelings over time get trapped inside the body. Now, if we think about this for a minute, um, I, and I'm, I'm going to maybe jump ahead a little bit to how um, when we started to think, what we started to notice in bodies of people who had cancer, we started to notice first that there were very specific blockages along the nervous system, specifically along the spine and the vagus nerve. When you think about this for a second, that energy is better conducted along the nerves than it is along meridians. It's just that we can't needle a nerve and, and still have friends, you know. Um, we have to conduct the chi through the nerves in a different way. And so the idea is to, to take the pressure or unobstruct the particularly the nerves that exit the spine close to the spine that correspond to the organs in question. So for example, like if we're looking at like the third thoracic vertebrae, right around that area, if a person typically has lung cancer and you start palpating around that area, you'll find a pretty powerful tender spot there. That area has been, been obstructed in some way. And now we could say how, and then we get back to this idea of suppression. It's not always about emotions. It's just that in our culture, it often is. Um, let's just say, for example, and we'll go, we'll get very classic about it. And I'm not saying that this is the only way, but let's just say classically, the lungs are affected by grief or sadness, excessive grief and sadness. If, if my lungs are, are bearing that burden of grief and sadness, then what happens is my central nervous system from my brain will have to keep sending a signal down to, to adjust or to add more energy to that organ in some ways to try to balance out so that that organ isn't going to fail me in some way. As that nerve keeps firing, all the tissues around it start to become irritated and they begin to become a little bit brittle. It actually robs energy from the musculature around that area and it begins to press down on that nerve. Now we've obstructed the flow even further. So in this way, we can almost see cancer as um, almost like a defense. Because what happens is if, if the organ is accustomed to living towards a, a strong flow of energy as, it, as it's coming around into the organ, and that flow gets compromised, the cells will mutate into something that can survive at a, at a lower flow of energy, a lower conductive, conduction of energy. So in, in, in the first stage of cancer, we can almost see it as a defense against organ failure. The problem, that, of course, that we all run into is that as these cells are now replicating according to a, a, a lesser vibration of energy, they begin to multiply into something that then starts to consume the energy of and the energy and the strength and the tissues around it. And so in this way, cancer spreads because in a, in a very strange way, it's not being fed properly. I remember the first time we started to talk about this, my teacher used to say, it's, it's very similar to, um, in one way, the making of a criminal in, in some ways. Like if, if someone is starved, they're going to steal uh, to survive. And in this way, we could almost see cancer like that, where, okay, the organ has been uh, starved, but then what happens is it starts stealing the energy of the organs and the tissues around it, and then those cells begin to replicate according to that pattern. And so <clears throat> I remember uh, going back, it's funny, uh, going back to see the physicians when they um, they started to tell me that I was delusional, even though I was healthy. 
And they said, so, you know, what, what, what worked for you? And I explained what worked for them. And the guy said, well, you know, that's, you know, you don't really believe that, do you? I don't know why I wouldn't. Uh, I'm still here. But it makes sense if there's, if, if, even when we start to think of the yin and yang of the situation, if we can produce cancer through negative radiation, right? If I'm exposed to nuclear radiation or excessive x-rays, let's say, my cells are going to mutate. If I'm exposed to positive radiation, which in this means, in this way, healthy chi, then why wouldn't the cells mutate back? And this was the theory that we were working on. First, we wanted to free up the flow of energy. Let's just say like we, we open up the, these areas along the spine. And then once we open up these areas and can receive the energy, then what we try to do is receive as much positive radiation into that system now, that unobstructed flow so that the cells can mutate back. And we found that as long as we, it's just like anything, if we get it early enough, if we address this early enough, we can reverse this without too much trouble. Um, and this has happened hundreds of times. I, I, you know, just so that you know, I mean, this has a very strong clinical application. Um, when I was way back when, uh, over 30 years ago, when I first started to to intern with Tom Tam, we would see over 50 people a day with this. Um, so, you know, this was very much reproducible. And so that's that's one way when we think about this idea of positive radiation, bringing it in. The other part is, what do we generate? What kind of energy do we generate? Now, if um, the biggest magnetic field, electromagnetic field that we produce in the body happens to be from the heart. And in the tradition that I trained in, we usually see the body as having two hearts. There's the physical heart, um, you know, the pump, and then sitting below it is the spiritual heart. And uh, in, in training in the tradition that I came to, they said, well, you can become a fully realized human being when we can fully combine the spiritual heart and the physical heart. But when we think about what's in the in the spiritual heart, it's it's in one sense, it's what we indulge. And one of the ways I used to teach this class for people is the first thing that I would ask people to do is it, it, it always makes sense when you think about it in the negative, right? If I say, well, think about the last time you really got angry. When you were, when you really got furious with someone and you call that moment back, how does your body feel? And you may notice when we start to feel either angry or sad or some kind of very um, extreme negative emotion, the body contracts, it constricts. It basically says like, this isn't a good energy for you. You're summoning a vibration that happens to exist out there. You're pulling more of it magnetically into your body. And if we pull more of this, too much of this into your body, you're going to get sick. And so this is one of the reasons why a lot of times when people indulge their sort of negative emotions, they start to get lower and lower in energy. And the reason is that the body starts to constrict it as a way of trying to protect us. Conversely, if we think about it in the positive, if, you, if we think about either a place or a person or something that we really love, something that really opens us up, if we go into this place and really sit with that for a moment, we may start to notice that, wow, we, we become a little bit lighter and fuller and more open. Because the body says, yes, this is good for me. This is positive radiation generated both from within first, but then attracted universally. Because, of course, these experiences exist also independently of us. These energies exist independently of us. And so mindset starts to play a really big role in this. And, of course, all of us are familiar with this. And this is, of course, really popular among the New Age movement. And I don't mean to say that everything is about intention. I think that's an oversimplification. But what I do mean to say is that it does play a very important role. That however, whatever it is that we indulge, we then get this corresponding energy that comes in. And this is the difference between sort of good and bad radiation or, or our, our mindset as, in a sense, positive radiation or negative, depending on what we decide to do with it. And so when we think about this, if, if we're able to sort of maintain an openness in the central nervous system, there's a, a couple of ways of, of opening this area. 
One of the ways that we did it, of course, you can do it through acupuncture. The points along the spine are called the Huato points. Uh, a Warning States era physician about uh, 220 AD discovered the central nervous system. Um, and it's it's pretty much in between the spinous process along the along the spine for those of you who happen to practice Chinese medicine. Um, chiropractors, of course, use it all the time. Uh, if you want to know like which levels attaches attached to which, um, you can always just Google a um, a chiropractic chart. They're right there. It will just say, oh, okay, T three to the lungs, you know, T four to the pericardium, T five to the to the heart, that sort of thing, T six to the diaphragm, and so forth. Um, each one of these levels. And so when somebody says, look, I've got a, a, an illness or a disease or a disorder, you can almost always palpate around there and you'll feel that that area is pretty tender. And this was something that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, was um, used by Huato back around 220 AD and is usually taught in acupuncture schools, but not that much. But we found that it was particularly effective in the treatment of cancer if we could open up the area along the spine. Now, a lot of us, um, you know, I can't needle my own spine um, and I can't always keep running to an acupuncturist to do it for me. And so an, another one of these Taoist arts that's really good about opening up the spine, um, for those of you who with Shifu have studied Bagua, um, the standing meditation in Bagua, the sort of turning of the spine and standing in, in that position, uh, lowering down, sinking down, and regulating your breath while you do it, that gradually opens those areas. It's a great preventative uh, for cancer. Um, certainly a lot of the yogic uh, spine openers, twisting of the spine is, is incredibly helpful. There are certain spine, spinal rolling uh, you know, movements that we can do that kind of keep that area open. Uh, of course, massage will do it. If we can get somebody to really get in there, you kind of have to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, anything that kind of stimulates and opens that area to free the area up is both a good preventative, but also really valuable in treating this as a condition. And so if we can open up that, that area, and then the second nerve pathway is uh, the vagus nerve. Um, there's a couple of things that are kind of interesting about the vagus nerve. Um, that's sort of the parasympathetic response. We think about the sympathetic response leaving from the spine or the we need to act actively do something to the um, to restore either to either correct a condition uh, or to prevent a condition. It sort of like feeds the organ. It, it, it makes it active. And that's, I think, probably the biggest key to preventing and treating cancer. But then when we talk about the parasympathetic response, parasympathetic response is the vagus nerve, which um, comes to the closest, it comes the closest to the surface of the body, interestingly enough, at your tragus, the sort of little flap of your ear that uh, covers the hole right there. And so one of the one of the craziest things, if you're ever feeling like you need to calm down or relax, if you grab that little flap and pinch it really hard a few times, It'll send a pulse down and and kind of relax the nervous system a little bit. So that's that's also one way. But then also what we want to do is see if we can open up the sternocleidomastoid muscle that's along here. And almost always when someone has a, a chronic inflammatory condition, if if we press along either side, usually more on the right side than the left, and I'll explain why in a minute. If we press along here, you start to notice that area is really tender. It, you'll find a spot, particularly down around the clavicle area, like right around the, um, oh God, the muscle just, uh, the platysma, sorry. The platysma, there's a little muscle there where it kind of holds all that in place. If we start pressing down in there, you start to notice that area is quite tender. Opening this area up, that opens up the parasympathetic response. When we get the parasympathetic energy moving down there, that begins to bring that positive energy or that, that positive chi back into the organ so that the cells are able to mutate back. Uh, they begin to sort of restore and realign themselves. And so those seem to, those are the, the, the two ways in which we want to say, um, you know, how do, we, how do we get to sort of either preventing and getting rid of the tumors and then how do we then restore the organ back to its healthier state? So those are the two ways, at least mechanically, that we want to get there. 
Um, when we the the other sort of classical understanding of of cancer, at least in Chinese medicine, is this idea of liver congestion. And so if we say, okay, well, if the liver is is decongested, and it makes perfect sense, if the liver is is functioning very well, then it's going to cleanse the blood of stress hormones, um, of toxins. Um, and also, when we think about this, the liver sort of rules the tendons. And when we think about that, if the tendons are tight and compressed, it's also going to compress the spine, it's going to compress this area in the neck. It's, and this is why I was saying typically on the right side, if there's a chronic inflammatory condition, it's usually a little bit more painful in this area here, uh, because the, the heat from the liver, even in a body, if the liver is quite hot, even in a body, heat rises and it tends to kind of get stuck in this, in this area. And then it tends to compress that uh, vagus nerve area uh, because it's, it's actually looking for a way to vent or escape. This is why a lot of times people say, oh, well, you know, we can use like gallbladder 20 or uh, bladder 9 and 10 in that area. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to kind of clear some of this, this energy and heat. Um, and so when we talk about the liver, another way of sort of, um, what do I want to say, um, preventing cancer, but also in treating it is, is to very gently, and this is really important, to gently decongest the liver. Um, in this way, and this isn't really a, a topic for this discussion, a good herbalist comes in handy. Um, and certainly things like uh, bitter greens, a lot of times when you're saying, uh, and we would do this a lot for people who were um, undergoing chemotherapy, because of course, uh, a lot of times you can't use a lot of herbs with people who are going through chemotherapy, we would say, okay, steam bitter greens eat them and drink the broth. And that very gently will start to decongest the liver and help the liver to, to, to clean itself out. Um, and so the importance of keeping the liver healthy or, or qigongs that are a little bit specific to the, to the liver can be also very, very effective. Um, and of course, a, a way of preventing that uh, or preventing cancer is by doing exactly what it is that most of us do here, right? If we're doing arts like Tai Chi, Xingyi, Bagua, um, gentle Qigongs, things like this, this always keeps a smooth flow of Qi. And if we have that sm smooth flow of Qi, it definitely is going to open up the liver. It acts as a really great and powerful preventative. Um, as always, right? Well, there's that old expression, they say, when is the best time to plant a tree? And they say, 20 years ago, uh, the next best time is today. Um, and so when we think about this, if, if we can get to this place, uh, you know, early and consistency, consistently, if we can sort of keep this flow open, then these, these remedies become immaterial. We don't really need to worry about them, of course. Um, and so with that, um, we then once we've got sort of things unobstructed and clear, and we're able to sort of get this channel flow of energy moving through the next best thing that we probably want to think about is bringing in this kind of positive energy which we're, we're sort of addressing and one of the things that i've often suggested to people to try um, and a lot of people say well you know it's like I, I i'm practicing qigong and i don't feel any better you know this is one of the things that i i hear people talk about all the time one of the things i might ask is how are you practicing um because a lot of times mindset when one practices can really make a difference. If mindset says, okay, what radio station am I tuning my nervous system to? And it really is the nervous system that receives most of the chi. They call the spine the heavenly pillar. If the nervous system is receiving the chi, then what signal am I sending to my nervous system? It's almost like a radio station. It says, well, what, what, what am I bringing into my body? Now, if I'm practicing Qigong with, oh, all right, great. Now I have to practice Qigong. If I'm doing this with either reluctance or resentment, I may not get the full result. I'll get something, but I'm not getting the full result. And so this idea of being as relaxed, as calm, as peaceful, if it's possible, even a little bit joyful. Um, now, that's that I, I kind of find an interesting uh, approach when people say, well, you know, what if I'm not, what if it's not a joy to me? It's like, okay, um, but some things are. 
right? I mean, you know, sometimes the best, it's going to sound a little bit crazy, but sometimes when I'm practicing Qigong and I want, really want to get into that positive mindset, I can think about the best pesto sauce I've ever had or, you know, um, the the best conversation I just had with somebody or the, a, a really heartfelt experience or the the last time I was able to pat a dog or anything like this, anything that kind of gives that sort of ebullient feeling, even if it's very light, you'll be surprised because the body will gradually start to open with that. One of my teachers used to say that all energy is contagious. Uh, and then, of course, he used to follow that up with, so let's be mindful of how we're going to infect people today. Uh, there's something about that. We, in, in some ways, we can, once we start to attract this sort of positivity in one sense, this sort of joyfulness, it, it begins to become magnetic. We begin to pull more of it. And a lot of times a body doesn't know the difference between right now and something that just happened. If you're calling it up in your mind, it's still happening right now. If I'm calling up this experience of the best pesto sauce I ever had, or, uh, you know, uh, the most beautiful flower I've seen in days or something like this, my body is going to respond as if that's happening right now, at least in some sense, it's going to open to that. And so what we want to do is if we can acquire that mindset before and during practice as much as possible, and still remain quite calm and relaxed, then we're going to get the best flow, the best positive radiation that we can get into the body. This is, I think, especially important for any of these practices is to be as, as uh, joyful as possible to see if we can bring some of this in. And then finally, we get into this, this idea of, of a way of living. When we think about a way of living, um, of course, it winds up being in harmony, right? as much as possible, in harmony with nature, in harmony with each other, in harmony with ourselves. If you think about this, even in terms of physics, right? If you ever got stuck taking uh, physics and you had to study Ohm's law, it says resistance equals voltage over current, which fundamentally means the more resistance we have, the less current we have. Resistance produces friction, friction produces heat, heat produces pathology in the body. And so when we think about this, this is one of the reasons why, for example, all of the, 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 the internal arts, one of the things that they suggest that we do, right, is relax, stay relaxed, lower the resistance in the body so that the chi can flow. But the same is also true, I think, of mindset, a resistant mindset. Uh, it's funny, uh, my father has this expression, he calls it Irish amnesia. Uh, which basically means you forget everything except every rotten thing everybody ever said or did to you. Um, and this it's this idea of indulging in that kind of mindset, you know? It's like if we sit there and we say, oh, you know what that, and, and this and all of this, and now I start producing a kind of resistance within myself. To what? Who am I fighting? But the thing is, the more the more resistance I start producing inside of myself, the more of that energy, the more friction I start creating on the inside. And this becomes so important in, in our practices, even in terms of living, to say like, okay, you know what? Can I be not just in harmony between all of us, with us, with us as people, or uh, what do I want to say? In, in harmony with my surroundings, right? I want to keep things sort of like clean and tidy and orderly and 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 as comfortable as possible. But also my really, my internal environment, it, it's astounding how many times I wind up catching myself doing the very thing that I know is not good for me, which is what? Projecting into the future. Wow, what if this terrible thing happens? Or I remember that time that this, this felt terrible or any of any of those things. Why would I keep feeding that to myself? And so it's just noticing it also. I remember having uh, one teacher who used to say to me, I'd say, well, you know, what do you do when you have these thoughts come in? He said, well, notice them. They'll become embarrassed and leave. I feel like there's something to that. You know, there is something about this idea of, of 
we don't necessarily, you know, you can't say don't think about zebras, for example. It doesn't work. The mind doesn't work in a in a negative. It's just more like looking at it and being like, oh, why am I doing that again? What is this? Now you introduce a curiosity to that thought. When you introduce a curiosity to that thought, thoughts move in a wave-like pattern. You collapse that thought and it starts to rebuild into something a little bit more positive each time. It becomes habitual. And so this idea of being in harmony as much as possible, at least within ourselves, because I definitely can't control what happens either at work or in traffic or in a bank line, any of those things. But what I can do is I can begin to condition my responses to those things. And of course, you know, all of the practices and philosophies that we're, we're getting with one another and through Shifu, this is, this is I think, the idea, right? This, this idea of being like incredibly harmonious. So we don't have to start worrying about things like cancer. Um, and so it's just trying to say like, okay, you know, like what in one sense, how do we eliminate those things that cause us negative radiation? And on the, and on the other sense, how do we keep adding to those things that do? And of course we hear this all the time. You hear people saying, oh, keep a gratitude journal. I, I don't. Um, but I sure am grateful for a lot of things. You know, we can absolutely notice those things that are beautiful to us and take a moment to appreciate them. You'll notice if you notice the physical sensation that your body will respond. And so just to kind of sum up on some of this, right? If we're, if we're looking to use energy to one, what do we want to say? Treat, if, if cancer is already present, then the first thing we want to do is, again, I'm going to just take this through kind of systematically. The first thing is, let's find out what which organs we're talking about, you know. And then it's very easy. You Google a chiropractic chart. You find out which level of the spine corresponds to that area. Press it. Find the area. You'll find a blockage. You will find a tender spot or a pretty solid knot in there. Open that area up. Let's open it up or, or, you know, periodically just open up the spine in general, open up that area so that that's restored, open up this area along the sides of the neck. This can be done through acupuncture, massage, any kind of stimulus, the standing posture of Bagua, yoga, spinal rolling, any of those things. Then the next part that we want to pay very close attention to is decongest the liver. Um, and that's going to be, okay, let's not uh, take a lot of toxicity into the body as best we can. Um, the other part is, let's see if we can use like a lot of bitter greens, find a really good qualified herbalist to gently decongest the liver. And I do want to say qualified herbalist. Most of the time when I go into health food stores and I look at what happens to be in a liver cleanse, it's usually all the wrong herbs. Um, they usually tend to use herbs that increase liver function, but don't clean it out. And that's kind of the analogy that I would give is if there's a doorway and people are trying to, you have 30 people trying to get through one narrow doorway, it's really not going to work out that well. Um, so a good qualified herbalist to decongest the liver that will clean the blood. It will clear frustration. It will relax the tendons and it's going to, uh, contribute to a very good, smooth flow of chi. Then I would say, let's get into a good and regular Qigong practice with a really, really good um, positive mindset as best we can. Um, you know, I, again, let's, um, you know, we're here for a very short time. Let's enjoy it as much as possible. Um, and to catch ourselves when we start indulging, producing that negative vibration inside the body, let's just keep noticing it. It will become embarrassed and leave. Um, and that is is fundamentally, um, it's, I, I know I kind of moved really fast here, but fundamentally, this is how through energy cultivation and through all, all of these practices, we're able to overcome this disease. And I, I want to open it up for questions if anybody happens to have any. I realize I just said a lot in a very short time. Um, well, how we usually do this so that you don't have to, uh, you know, if you're watching the chat so far back is I'll, I'll kind of like give, just kind of feed you some of the questions because we have some good oh, questions in the chat. Okay, great. That'd be um, great. People 
obviously, and, and myself as well. Uh, I really appreciate the talk about the Huato Jajis because that's the form of Twain that I add to every treatment. When mm. I do an acupuncture, uh, opens up the Huatos in, in three different directions. And um, so I'm, I'll definitely be referencing this for my own understanding because I think that's an awesome connection as to why that treatment seems to work for everything as opposed to <laughs> really? just for, you know, anything around the spine. Yeah. Um, you explained that really nicely. The uh, Andrea talks about, uh, when you're talking about the central nervous system, yes. uh, she's asking if you're referring to the sun gel and yuan chi. No, no. I, I, quite literally, the nerves that, that, that exit off of the spine. Um, we're talking more from a from a, a more Western perspective in this way. Now, of course, the Huato points, he understood that very well. Um, but really, it's about opening up. And, and, and I realize this is this is we're using this theory of acupuncture to treat this this what we would call a sort of uh, acute or dangerous disease uh, in that way. Does that make sense? OK. Yeah, I think that's. um. And one thing that we have to remember, too, when we talk about ancient Chinese medicine physicians is that there wasn't a delineation between Eastern and Western medicine. Yes. This is the same physician. He was doing acupuncture. He was doing yes. surgery. He was giving people herbal analgesia, analgesia, and he was, you know, talking about the central nervous system um, quite a bit before Western medicine had any concept of it. Yeah. So this wasn't anti-Chinese medicine the way sometimes it's like nerves are, are Western. It's actually... No, he was using them. <laughs> yeah, as it, as it turns out, there are nerves in the East and West, right? Yeah. Turns um, out we're all people. Uh, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, the the idea here is not to obviously create a, a battle between the two, but but a, a sort of synthesis in the way that the two mindsets might work. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, another question here, are you making any assessment where the cancer is located in terms of depth, in terms of jing, uh, ying, no. blood, body fluids, qi? No. No, no. It's, um, which I, I also understand is very traditional. Um, it, it's more about, uh, you know, I'm taking this more from a qigong perspective in this way, which is um, if, if, if one practices that, like an applied qigong therapy, for example, um, you'll absolutely feel its location. Um, I, and not to sort of put the idea into somebody's head, but a lot of times, at least on the palm or somewhere else, it usually feels like a very sharp static electricity, that area. And so the idea is to kind of re just release the energy because the body is very much trying to push it towards the surface. Once we open it up or we create a, a an avenue to sort of release it, 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 it will happen. Awesome. Uh, Yvonne is asking about types of herbs that can decongest the liver. Uh, my favorite is chrysanthemum um, because it's very user friendly. Um, you know, it's really kind of hard to go wrong with that. Uh, you know, a lot of the other stuff, I you know, I like chrysanthemum. I like gentian. The other stuff I would definitely want to see a qualified herbalist for to, to get a, an idea of your overall condition. Um, you know, for example, you know, if you give somebody bupleurum, they can become anemic in four days if if they're they're not really like quite strong or solid in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Bitter absolutely. bitter greens. You know, I love bitter greens. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, other questions here. Uh, we have: Do you have a preference when to use the Huato Jajis versus uh, back shoes on the bladder meridian? I use them together often. Um, my I, so I don't really have a preference, but what I find is most of the time, when we're for our purposes, when we're talking about cancer, most of the time it's right in the Huato points, right along there is usually where you find it, or even just a few millimeters lateral. Um, but I use both. There's no harm in doing both. Awesome. Uh, Rosie's asking, aside from maintaining good health from Taiji and Qigong. Uh, and other practices, do we need to complement this by seeing a Chinese herbalist? Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, that's the short answer. I, I always say, like, look, you know, again, we're not here for very long. Let's make it count. Um, when I think of all of the all of the ways in which we invest time and money in things that um, matter a lot less, 
you know, I, I was recently at a restaurant and somebody, um, I, I heard the bill was $2,300 for four people. I have no idea what it was that they had. I hope it was good. Um, but th these are the same people who would be like, I'm not going to go to an herbalist. That's too expensive, you know, or I'm not going to do these things. So it really, I, I feel like, you know, making this existence a, a priority is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would second that too. I mean, I live in a house where we have two acupuncturists and herbalists and uh, no matter what you're doing, there's, we're still eating food. You yeah. know, her herbs, are, you know, and, and not always the best stuff, unless we're impeccable. Yeah. <laughs> and even if yeah, we are, it's, maybe. It's good to be checked out, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a very specific question. Okay. Um, so let me know if you feel comfortable answering that in a public sure. kind of setting. Uh, two, two questions for emergency support, life support. In case, uh, yeah, emergency life support. I would like to know what kind of points you suggest for um, cases of collapse and epilepsy and nosebleeds. Oh, it's interesting. I, in in general, I this this is this is kind of a, a harder one to answer because it winds up being very specific to the case. Mm -hmm. Um rather than sort of saying it's a very specific point. And this is sort of where I feel like the the practice of Qigong and the sensitivity that, sensitivity that comes with it is invaluable because I would definitely feel for where the, the, the location of where the pressure is, where is the heat, invent it. Um, having said that, you know, probably the easiest part would probably be around like, you know, um, like governing vessel 14 around that area and also the Huato Quince just to kind of like, let's get that heat away from the head as much as possible. It's probably the safest part, at least off the top of my head, but then I would probably want to scan for where else I would find the heat. T9 also, uh, you know, vent some of that liver heat and cool the blood. Uh, but that's just, you know, off the top of my head. I, I mean, um, I, I, in a way, go looking for trouble, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those are pretty good general options, but definitely if you have specific questions, then being in the presence of uh, whether it's working with someone online, Paul, I don't know if you take online patients or yeah. or visiting your local kind of Chinese medicine, Qigong practitioner who's qualified might be helpful for specific, you know, medical conditions. Yeah, um, it doesn't always adhere to theory. And, and one, one thing I also want to say about theory, too, is that I used to get this question a lot when I was teaching is people would say, well, you know, I did these treatments were prescribed for, say, like Parkinson's or something else. Why didn't they work? Um, and one of the questions that I would say is one of the things we might want to take into consideration was when was this written down? Because if this was 1700 years ago, I guarantee you that 1700 years ago, they had different stresses on their bodies than the ones we have today. Um, not everything is static. And I think that's that's part of the the my hope is that 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 more more forums like this where we can talk about experience um and, and sort of bring it out and say, wow, you know, like hey, I, I I've discovered that this works better than this, or I've had success here and there, you know, it, because we are different now. Yeah. Uh, okay, what else? What are we doing? I think um, if people have any other questions, by all means, drop them in quickly. Otherwise, let's see. Otherwise, I think that may be the end of our questions for for the moment. So, Paul, thank you so much for your um, your talk and the clarity around the system that you're using. I think anybody right. can walk out of here and, and have a good idea of uh, how to treat some of these uh, diseases based on your, your methodology here, which is awesome. Well, thank thank you so much for having me. I I do apologize for my lack of tech savvy, um, and um, you know certainly uh, it's it's been a pleasure today. So thank thank you for that.